Hello, people. We are live. Hi. I'm going to pull it up on here so I can see the comments easier because apparently I can't read. Oh, right. Oh, we already have a question. Awesome. Wow. Oh my God. All right. Dark Warrior says, any advice on how to break a dog's focus off a trigger? He's prong and e-collar trained, but will ignore both. Cool. All right. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Hi, guys. This is Rachel and Sarah with Beehill mm -hmm. Dog Training. So I guess I should have some sort of introduction if this is the first time oh, anybody's joining in. Um, but anyway, so we are here doing our weekly live, and we're going to be talking mostly about prong collars today. I'll definitely answer that question. Um, we are going to try and keep the questions uh, related to prong collars, at least for now. And if we have time at the end, we may just open it up to anything. Sure. Um, but yeah, so we are going to be talking prong collars, everything about them. And I'm trying to get this pulled up on my phone. Oh, it's being a pain in the butt. And we're fresh Sorry. off puppy class, so we're like, right? <laughs> still getting Puppies! Our, still getting ourselves together. That's why we're running a little bit late, too. So, all right. Um, yeah, I can't find it. I'll just read. Comment. You'll just have to read all it over right. here. So, Dark Warrior, as far as breaking the focus off the trigger. Um, so, prong and e-collar trained means that you're working with prong collar and e collar, but remember that those devices aren't doing the training, you're doing the training. So as far as breaking the focus off of a trigger, that's part of your training. So um, let's say that your trigger is a squirrel, and this will this goes for anything. First of all, you want to make sure your dog has a really solid heel command, that they know and understand the heel command, um, which means that they're walking in a heel on a soft leash, not because you're holding them in place, and you want to do that in low-level um, distraction environment. So you get a really good heel command there. And then what you do is once the dog knows and understands the heel command on both your prong and your e-collar, then you will start correcting the dog for breaking that command. And that would include for focusing on a trigger. Um, now you can also reward for eye contact and, and give food and stuff like that. But as you know, um, a lot of times food is not going to override a trigger that the dog is staring at. So um, really, if a dog kind of casually glances at something or looks at something momentarily, I don't worry about that. But when you start to see the intense focus, I mean, the moment that you start to see that, especially if it's a known trigger, squirrel goes by, the moment the dog even starts to look, give a leash pop, give a remote collar correction. Um, if those things aren't working. Can you do both? Yes, you can do both. Um, if those things aren't working a firmer leash pop, a higher level e-collar correction, but most likely in that case, if you're still struggling, you're not doing it soon enough. Um, so you want to be correcting before any sort of reactivity or any sort of laser focus. Another great um, exercise you can do is suddenly changing direction. This is called the 180 move. You would suddenly turn around and go the other direction that you were going. The dog is focused on the trigger um, and right before you hit the end of your leash, so what I mean by that is you've changed direction. If the dog's that focused on the trigger, then it hasn't changed direction with you. So you're walking this way, the dog's over here. Right before you hit the end of your, of your leash, you give a firm prong collar pop and or a remote collar correction. And the dog goes, whoa, how'd you get over there? I should probably join up in lots of changing direction. Um, and really anything that you can do to increase engagement um, in your walk. So changing up your pace, changing up your your direction, your position, asking for commands while you're out on the walk, putting the dog in a down, all of that should help get the engagement more on you. Is that a situation, Rachel, where you think you want to, maybe if you if you can, so say the trigger is, and it's, something, it's a known that you can work in a small way, in a very controlled environment, instead of just going, hey, you know, don't go to a park full of squirrels, yes. basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, you know, keep... Keep your work, start your work in as low of a distraction, low level distraction environment as possible, um, and then increase from there. So like I said initially, make sure you've got a solid heel at home, whether that's in the house or in your backyard or in a really calm environment, and then start to expand your walk out. So if you're really struggling on lots of environmental distractions, then definitely start with um, an environment that's very calm and then just slowly branch out and maybe your walk is just you working the dog in the driveway and then when you've got that really good you start working the dog on the street in front of your house um if you just have like real specific triggers the dog does great until they see that one squirrel then you want to be 
aware of it and on the lookout. And when you see the trigger, you don't want to like avoid it, but you want to be prepared to correct that dog at a high enough level to break that stare before it starts to escalate. So you see the squirrel, the moment the dog even notices it, you can go ahead and correct if you know that that's going to be a trigger for that. And you are always better off to correct a little too high than a little too low. So, so Avery says, um, about two weeks ago, I started doing a ton of pressure and release training, but my dog continues to sometimes resist, uh, to resist it when I correct him or guide him back to me. Okay, so um, I'm presuming you're talking about on prom collars that the dog is resisting and putting on the brakes. So um, you can, I would train dog with your daily food um, or or you can use like really tasty treats, something that dog's really excited about. <laughs> Sorry, we've got a cat at our feet. Hang on. Us. Come here. Come on, Chins. <laughs> She's like, nope. Come say hello. I'll come distract you and say hi until so you try to hold me and then I'm, then I'm gone. <laughs> That's Shenzi. Um, so anyway, uh, you guys, if you haven't seen these these lives before, we keep this pretty informal. So, <laughs> apologies. We keep everything pretty informal. Yeah, I know. We're, we're, we're just about. informal people, you know. I would prefer it that way. But so um, Bella, that's Belle in the background. Yeah, this is my dog Belle. Um, she's going to be our demo dog if we need it. So um, if you are struggling with your dog putting on the brakes with your crown collar, have your food in a treat pouch with you. Um, you have really tasty treat that you're using. I just trained with the dog's daily kibble, honestly. Um, and what you do is if the dog is kind of stuck in one spot and not wanting to move, and, and one big trigger I found for a lot of dogs is putting on the brakes when they feel the pressure coming over their head this way. So if you are um, putting pressure on the leash kind of this way over the front of them and the dog's wanting to resist backwards, a lot of dogs tend to do that. So what you can do is um, a little exercise that's called north, south, east, west. And that is where you move to those different positions around the dog and put pressure on in different positions. So maybe the dog doesn't want to move forward when you put that kind of pressure on. Then get to the dog's left shoulder and, and put sideways pressure on. When you're putting that pressure on your leash and your crown collar, you're going to hold steady pressure and just slowly increase that until the dog starts to yield to that pressure. Um, sometimes if they're really putting on the brakes, you can try a little bit of a pop. Um, but you basically, if you change positions around the dog, especially off to the side, and you start putting pressure on, what happens is it's a lot easier for the dog if you're directly in front of them to brace evenly with both sides of their bodies and refuse to move. But when you get off to the left or the right and you start bringing that sideways pressure over, then they tend to get knocked off balance a little bit. And not like knocked off balance like they're going to fall over, but you knock them off balance a little bit that they start to shift their weight. And the moment that that dog starts to yield to that leash pressure, even if it's just as slight as them shifting their weight, you can reward that. And that's not, this isn't necessarily how I start every dog on a prong collar, but you do have occasionally a dog that really is just unsure about it and they really put on the brakes. And um, those are some things you can do. So you click in food and reward. But also, a lot of times, it's just your demeanor. Um, if you are being very hesitant, and you know, if the, if the dog, if there's the damn cat. <laughs> if the dog is being hesitant, and you are being hesitant, then you kind of get in the cycle. So you want to just be very matter of fact, like, okay, it's time to go, let's go, and you can give maybe a little pop with that leash and just start walking. A lot of dogs will do really well with that. You just start walking. It doesn't have to be pretty. The dog doesn't have to be in a perfect heel right off the bat. Um, but just get that dog moving. Get that dog moving. And you get them comfortable with the feel of the prong collar. And, and again, to throw this out there, um, you know, this whole episode is going to be about prong collars. And there is a lot of misinformation out there all over the Internet um, about prong collars. So we're going to be busting some myths up in here yeah and um, that show. I, mean, yeah, I know um, busting some prong collar myths and answering those questions but I want to make sure that you understand that if you have a dog that is uncomfortable with the prong collar you're just introducing it and they act nervous or timid or they put on the brakes it does not mean that you are hurting them um, it just means that it feels different to them it's weird it's strange and that dog's particular way of handling that is to put on the brakes and be nervous and it is very likely that if your dog is doing that, it acted the exact same way the first time it had any kind of leash ever put on it. That's so right. it's a, 
a pretty common thing that we run into. The prong collar is a different sensation than, than the leash and collar you've been using before. Well, so, and this is, I don't know if this is Tanya or Tanya, but, and, and I want to, I want to ask a question in response to her question, mm -hmm. because this is what you, this is, this is what you, this is me regurgitating Rachel and you, don't you love it? It's great. So Tanya, Tanya, sorry, says, my puppy walks great with a prong collar, but pulls when wearing a slip lead. Will he always have to have to wear a prong collar? My question is, is that a problem? Why do you care? If the answer is yes. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. Um, why do you care? Why do you care if you always have to use a prong collar? Don't worry about it. You know, if you need a leash and collar on your dog anyway, make a prong collar. If it works and it's, we know it's not hurting them. And this is where we're going to get into some of our myth busting this evening. Yeah. We know it's not hurting them. And if it works, it, it shouldn't bother you. I mean, the answer for my puppy is yes. He will probably, she will probably always wear a prong collar because right. what, the second I put that dog on a slip lead, she's like, cool. Ah. So here's the thing. And, <laughs> and my dogs, I've had much longer than you and right. your puppy. Um, so my dogs are completely off leash trained. And um, so if, if they're walking in a heel, my leash is really just an accessory. It's there so other people feel comfortable. Like my dogs walk in a heel because they know, they know to walk in a heel. However, if I do take my dogs out somewhere and I need to put a collar and leash on, I choose my prong collar because to me, a prong collar is like having power steering, power brakes. You know, why drive a car without power steering, power brakes when the power steering, power brakes helps you, you know? So don't feel like there's anything wrong with using a prong collar. Don't be in a rush to get off of it. It is a tool that is there to help you and help your dog. And I mean, there's also plenty of times that I'll stick a slip lead on my dogs and walk them in that because again, they're just, they walk in a heel just because regardless of what's on them. Um, so I've taken them on walks around the neighborhood just with a slip lead on so that they're not off leash and making neighbors uncomfortable. But um, still, if I'm gonna take them out somewhere where there's a bigger chance of maybe they get distracted by something and, and you know, wanna break command or break a heel, I'm gonna use my prom because I love my proms. Um, so you don't like the quick release collar. Um, well, as, so as far as being a pain to get it on, like to me, it's, you know, if I got to put a flat buckle collar on versus I got to put a prong collar on, yes, a prong collar can be a little bit of a pain, especially if you're just learning to use it or you haven't used it all that much. But if you get a lot of practice on, I, I don't know, for me anyway, I use them all the time. I can't put a flat buckle collar on any faster than a prong collar. Honestly, I think I put a prong collar on faster. Well, and I was going to say <laughs> my prong collar, and I don't know without knowing you know, the size, and maybe this is a good time to jump in with a little bit of that sure. that you're using. I mean, mine it has gotten a little bit easier with time. Yeah, the yeah. More easy, and there are play around with which links you're using to open and close it with because there are some, like for me, and I'm going to reach across. Yep. So the closer I get to the ends, like this guy, I personally have a harder time getting on and off mm -hmm. than one closer to the middle. That's sure. just me. So yeah. and, and and Rachel, you can see, so this is one Rachel has just recently used. You can see she's using this end one to come on and off. I personally don't, but you figure out what works for you. My hands are stronger. Your hands, <laughs> your hands are stronger. I have little wimpy hands. No, I'm use, telling you. I just use these all the right time. now. Oh, um, so Tanya is saying he makes it a game. So what do you mean he makes it a game? He, he's making it a game. What is it difficult to put the collar on? Uh, elaborate on play that. with it. Yeah, elaborate right. on that. And we'll be happy to answer your question. Um, but for now, what I want to do is kind of backtrack and just kind of start from the beginning with prong collars, why we use them, what we're using them for. Um, because for anybody who comes back and, and is watching this later, you know, I want to have something a little more comprehensive. Um, so you guys, guys to you. Yeah, yeah. so and, and new to prong collars. So you guys yeah. ask your questions and we will come back to them. We're going to answer questions. I'm just not going to answer them right away for, for right now, except that I told you. He says to, he runs around and won't stay still. Oh, yes. Put your prong collar on and use your prong and leash to help guide that dog. Um, it, I'm a, I don't know if you crate or not, I'm a big fan of crating dogs. So if your dog's in the crate, that dog doesn't come out of the crate until it's got its prong collar on. Okay, so that should help you out. You, you go up to your um, crate, and I've got videos on my YouTube channel to teach calmness in the crate and how to wait to exit the crate. So you teach your dog to be calm in the crate. You teach them that when you open up the door that they wait to be released, they don't just come barreling out of the crate. When that dog is in the crate and waiting to be released, you put your prong collar on 
Um, and if they're jumping around and being nutso, then you correct that. So um, we're, we're not going to get too much into that right now, but I've got other videos that talk about that. So you just want to correct your, your crate manners and then pop your, your collar on right there from the crate, and that's going to set the tone for everything else and help you get that dog under control. So, um, oh, I see. Yeah, so it may just be that it's um, taking... So what she said, in case you're not reading the Sorry, comments as right. we go... <laughs> says but he will sit sit and stay when putting on the flat collar um so but it looks like doing that in the crate she yep. will help address. yeah putting doing that in the she, crate will take care of that and then and then um that's all especially for initially while you're working through some of your behavioral stuff and as you are working the dog and teaching expectations and teaching commands you are actually going to <laughs> Like, you guys can angle this down a little bit. What was that? Oh, the cat That was, cat my, that was my snack out. bag. Yeah, so my cat is trying to eat Sarah's snacks, and um, and chaos is ensuing. So, <laughs> anyway. Okay, um, I can back up, so I'm not. Am I going the right way? No. Yeah. No. So there's, oh, there's the cat. There's Shinzi beside my leg lamp. The Christmas <laughs> Story is one of the best movies ever, guys. Okay, so, um, and, and you're welcome, by the way. So um, what I'm going to do, like I said, ask your questions if you have them. Um, we're going to try and keep this related to prom collars unless we end up with a whole bunch of spare time at the end, which I don't see happening because no. we both really love to talk, um, especially about prom collars because, yeah, right. like I've already mentioned, there is a lot of really, really bad information out there. Um, I think we're going to make this a fourth time in a row, fifth time in a row. We're going to talk about positive training and kind of the – that's the positive only training world is where a lot of this misinformation comes from. So there are, Belle, can you not look yourself all through this video? <laughs> <laughs> She'll take things a little too far. We'll just keep it that. Well, but so what I want you to bring up uh -huh. is, we, well, if it's okay. Is I don't know yet. When, is <laughs> so when, <laughs> when you, you came to me the other day and said, you know, and, and just fired up because you oh. actually went out on a mission yeah. to go research, you know, the science behind prong collars not being good to use. Yeah, so, so okay. Here, here's what we hear a lot, especially from positive-only trainers, is that the science out there proves that prong collars are dangerous, they're harmful to dogs physically, mentally, emotionally, any way that they can be. Um, they, you know, these trainers will say the science proves that prong collars are harmful to dogs. And um, science proves that positive only training is beneficial and that any sort of punishment is bad for dogs, blah, blah, blah. So I actually went out to, and I've done this before. This is not the first time I've researched this because I also was accused of not doing my research, which I thought was funny because I'm like, that's, that's interesting. You never asked me what research I did. You just assume I've never done it because I trained with prong collars. Um, bitch, please. Like, I've done, <laughs> I've done lots of research, and you assume that I haven't. That's, sorry you think that. Well, and th that's what's sad, is that anybody who actually knows either one of us yeah. would not be surprised to go, oh, yeah. I know, they probably did a lot of Poor research big researchers, yeah. But, well, yeah. And, and because before I became a dog trainer, um, which, by the way, this dog right here is the reason why. She's like, yeah, that's me. I was a wild child. Um, you know, looking up how to properly use prong collars on her, everything that I had come across before was how awful prong collars were, how they harm dogs, how they hurt dogs. No, why no? She can't help it. She's like, I can't. But so, but you didn't you tell me? Now correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't this where one of our barn friends? Yeah, that's where I was going with that. Okay, sorry. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> um, so so actually, I got Bell. And the day that I adopted her, she, like, got loose and ran wild. And, like, this dog was a nightmare dog and um, would just drag me on leash. I'd have marks on my hands. I'd be, like, doing squats to walk her across the parking lot. Like, I'm actually sitting doing quad workout, trying not to get the <laughs> drug on my face. And um, everything I'd come across before was how prong collars hurt dogs. They... Um, you know, the, there's like two, one or two photographs that get circulated oh, of right, the bedding. holes. And it's yeah. like, guys, that picture is not from someone like popping a dog with a prong collar. That is an embedded collar. That is an improperly used prong collar. And that happens with, with flat buckle yeah. collars for the record. Look it up. I've seen leather collars, leather flat buckle collars, which are some of the safest collars out there as far as like not harming a dog. 
improperly put on will become embedded. So that photo that gets circulated with the holes in the dog's neck, that is not from a prong collar. Like, I don't see how it would be possible to put enough force into a prong collar to do that. Well, that and is an embedded collar my that My suspicion is is it's poorly fitted and it's probably been on for That's how it got embedded. Probably, yeah. Right. I mean Yeah, you know, that's from being left on and right. too tight and a dog growing and the skin growing around it. That is not from someone putting a prong collar on and, and doing that to a dog. Using it how it's supposed to be. But I had come across all that information and uh, tons of people out there do. Tons of people come across the articles that say the method behind using a prong collar is using pain and intimidation to force a dog to do what it is that you want it to do. And that could not be further from the truth. And what made me actually look into it is I decided that instead of just believing, you know, the mainstream stuff that I was reading, which we won't even go there today about mainstream stuff that's out there. But <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'll say that for another day. I know someone in my life who I trust and I've seen work with both human and animals and is one of the kindest, most compassionate people that I know. And she was at the time a dog trainer, professional dog trainer, and she used prong collars. And I was like, okay, she would not hurt a dog. There's no way. No. <laughs> no. And so I started doing research on just how to properly fit and use a prong collar. And then I came across finally a wealth of information that I was like, Oh, thank you. Um, and so I started learning everything that I know now. And um, so I just want to give that kind of backstory. I, I know what's out there. I know what is said. Going back to the, you know, the whole like people saying, oh, science shows this. So the other day I was like, all right, I've looked it up before, but I'm going to look it up again, trying to find this so-called science and studies that prove it. I haven't found them. Feel free to share if you have. Um, I have not found actual scientific studies. I found a few articles that quoted a study, but then had no reference for the study. I'm sorry, just because you write an article and claim that a study was done in Germany with 100 dogs, but you have no sources cited, and it, I can't find it anywhere. And it's not published. Doesn't right. mean it exists, so sorry, I'm not going to believe that until I see the proof. Um, I saw one article that really amused me that was all about all of the negative things with prong collars and it had tons of sources cited at the end every single one of them was from um an ophthalmologist oh my god the words not coming to me ophthalmology it was from different ophthalmology like articles and stuff okay so any collar can create problems with eye pressure and that's what they were pulling from as far as being able to cite these what dozen sources all of those were about eye pressure and then this article briefly mentioned eye pressure but instead was all about how prong collars are dangerous and hurt dogs well so to be you should that, explain like check your sources and just because someone is claiming that science says doesn't mean jack shit until you look that up and you find out if the science says. Well, and it's just like everything else. I mean, people can twist it all. Yep. Whichever way, whichever way they want to. So, I, so, so, love it. Um, so, like, where I get my information from, because the science is not heavily there one way or the other. That's right. Um, so, where I get my information from, freaking common sense. And that's what I thought at the time, you know, when I was going through this myself, I'm like, okay, let's see, let's just look at logic here. Someone that I know and trust who works with animals professionally um, uses these. Who's legitimately one of the nicest yeah. people that either of with us With human know. and dog. Um, and horse and whatever. And, yeah, right. and anything. Um, but, okay, so there's, there's one point. And then I thought, let's see, I'm not an idiot. Even though there's, I'm what? sure, tons of what? There's tons of positive trainers out there that are probably like, yes, you are. You're stupid. I don't give a shit what you think. Um, so I, I was like, well, I'm not an idiot. I can try this tool myself. I'm not going to use it in a way that hurts my dog. If I can, like, see that I'm causing problems or harm or stress, not, not even stress, because stress is not a bad thing, guys. But if I'm causing harm, I can stop. Right. Like, I'm not going to do anything that's going to harm my dog beyond, like, well, 
And common sense, take it one step further. If you put a prong collar on your dog, as we have somebody here, you know my dog's not responding. It, it, if it's a tool that doesn't work for you, mm -hmm. then don't use it. Right. Make sure you're using it properly. Do all of your research. Do exactly this. Go, hey, I've tried using it. This is the results I'm getting. Yeah. Get some advice. But not every dog, and we say this all the time, yeah. every dog is different. Not every dog responds the same way to every single thing. Mm -hmm. You know, some dogs work better with a slip lead than a what it, you know. I'm sure, not. yeah. Right. Really what it comes down to, if it's working for you, do it. And if it's not, don't. And leave everybody else the hell alone. Right. <laughs> um, so, let's let's show you what a prong collar is in case you're going, what is a prong collar? So, this is a prong collar. As you can see, it is very easy to make this thing look like a barbaric medieval device. Like, I get it. I know it looks, sorry, it's backwards. I know it looks awful, and that's why it's so easy for these to get a bad rep, because they look like torture devices, but these collars are actually designed specifically to prevent harm to a dog. They're designed to prevent dogs from choking out on collars, um, and it's like having power steering, power brakes, and no, that's not coming from a standpoint of pain um, and, and harm. These things are, are not designed to harm. Now, I will say, Brand matters. There's only really one brand that I recommend, and that is a Herm Springer. H-E-R-M, second word Springer, S-P-R-E-N-G-E-R. Um, Herm, uh, Herm Springer brand is just a highly um, superior brand for several reasons. Number one, the points on the We are palms. not being compensated for oh, that. Oh, yeah, no, I don't get paid a dime, but, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, they're fantastic. So they're made in Germany, um, and these points are rounded and smooth. And on other prong collars out there, it is very common to find, like, typically your average, like, PetSmart, Petco, Pet Shop, big box store does not carry from Springer collars. At least I haven't come across it. I found one or two local places that do. Typically, I, I order mine online. Um, but a lot of times when you look in the in the big box stores, you will you can feel the prongs and feel a difference that these get... Um, kind they, of chop up straight like by jagged. Cut, cut chain link. Yeah, I mean, you they can, don't, right. They are sharp. So again, using the wrong brand could harm a dog. So right. that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the other thing I like about the Herm Springers is they have this very nice kind of like fluid movement. The links all move nicely. You get nice smooth action from the chain. Um, I've, I've seen, I've had other dogs come into my board and trains wearing other types of prong collars that get all kinked up or they just don't really have that smooth action or they pop off really easily. So make sure you look into our Herm Springer brand prong collar. Now, the way these work is, I like to think of these prongs as like fingers. And again, not torture devices. They're not designed to, to use pain to train. Um, <clears throat> the little projections on this are like fingers. So if you take your the palm of your hand right. and you push against you and push against you, you feel this very displaced kind of pressure. Versus when I take my finger, I can use a lot less pressure and you feel it and understand what to do with it. Oh, you're trying to get me to move away from you. Um, versus like you could lean against me all day doing that. You can only lean against me so hard doing that. So these little fingers just provide a lot more information to the dog. Also, when it's fitted properly, which means snug, I see a lot of people using prong collars where they're way too loose. Um, when they're fitted properly, it's going to evenly distribute the pressure from your leash all the way around the dog's neck. So, so it's specifically not who yes. this is. So the flat buckle collar, you know, typically what you see is people use flat buckle collars or slip leads and the dogs pull and you get a pressure point right here. And that's when your dog starts choking out. Just like this. <laughs> yeah, I've been talking too much today. Um, but the dog can lean against that collar. They get this pressure point right here, and that's when the dog starts choking. Um, with this collar, you need to have it very snug and sitting up very high on the dog's neck, just under their ears. And when it's fitted snugly, which it's kind of hard to show this because this is much bigger than my hand is, um, but when it's fitted snugly, any pressure you put from the leash is going to be distributed evenly around the neck so that you're not getting a pressure point. But if you have this very loose, you can get a pressure point just like any other collar. So keep that in mind. Yeah, if um, it slides on your, well, you said it earlier today. So if it goes over the dog's head, it's too big. too big. And if it slides easily up and down their neck or around like this, it's too, too big. big. Yeah, it's got to be real snug. Well, and talk about fitment too, where it, where it should go. 
So you want your prong collar to sit just below the dog's ear, really as high up on the neck as it'll go. Um, I mean, sometimes you're gonna have prong collars that don't fit perfectly. They may slide just a little bit. So snug it up as much as you can. Um, your leash, so you've got these two rings on it. You've got your this little kind of egg-shaped one that swivels. This is where your leash attaches. And then you've got this perfectly round one. This is called the dead ring. This one's the live ring. This is the dead ring. And the dead ring, is, you're not going to attach your leash there. So you want to make sure that your leash attaches here and that when you put the collar on, let me show you this way, that it's not all twisted up. So these are also sometimes called pinch collars. Again, this information you hear, people will say, Oh, it's pinchy. Yeah, you, you, people will tell you, oh, pinch collars pinch the dog, and it makes them listen that way. Like, I don't know how you would train a dog with pinching. Like, guys, think about it this way. Using pain and fear to train a dog is not effective. Um, they're not going to learn and progress quickly that way. So, like, people try to say, oh, you intimidate and dominate with fear and pain to force a dog to do something quickly, and it's like, no. Fear and intimidation actually slows down the training process, so right. I really don't want to use that. So I'm not going to use tools that are that are freaking dogs out or hurting them. Um, but huh, what was I even talking about? So pinch, pinch collars. Mm -hmm. They're called pinch collars because you have to pinch these together to make them fit here. So these links go together. Sorry, everything's a little backwards. I keep like fidgeting around. Um, the Come on, Vanna White. Right. The links here go together just by you pinching the ends of this because they do flare out so that they're a little wider than here. So you pinch these and just put them through there. You can take apart any of these links. It doesn't matter. A Herm Springer collar has this center plate that's going to sit right around the dog's trachea in the middle. And you want your leash to come out, you know, at the top of the dog, um, on top of the back of their neck. Okay, so that's how that's going to work. Now, another thing we'll point out, didn't I bring that 2.25 in here? Oh, no. I thought you did. Oh, well, I had another collar to show size difference. And oh, I see it now. What did I do? It's on bed. Oh. Okay. So as far as sizing, um, there's really only two sizes that I tend to, well, that I ever have used. So this is the smaller size. This is a 2.25 millimeter Herm Springer Prong collar. And so this is going to be good for up to about like 35, maybe 45 pound dogs. Really anything getting to be about 45 pounds and up, you're probably going to be using the 3.0. So those are millimeter, that's the gauge of the link. You can see the size difference here if I can get my fat fingers out of the way. Um, so this being your 3.0 and your 2.25, okay? Um, if you are buying, like I know Chewy, I tend to get really good prices on Chewy. Um, again, I'm not getting any compensation for that. Um, but some, some websites will call them small, medium, large. The 2.25 is a small and the 3.0 is a large. Um, they do make bigger sizes than a 3.0, 3.25 and even a 4.0. I have never had to use that and I've worked with some really big dogs. She's got a Pyrenees. Yeah, know. I've got a Pyrenees. <laughs> um, I've worked with some really big dogs. I've never used anything above a 3.0. So um, maybe if you're training like an elephant with these, you might go bigger, but but really you'll be good. Um, and the cool thing is, so to the make these, just right. to make these fit, what you do is you can add and remove these links. So if the collar is too big, you just pop a link off. Okay, that link goes away, and now the collar is shorter. Um, not big enough, you can purchase extra links if you need to. You just add, add links in. So it works awesome for like a growing dog. You can add links as they grow if you're talking younger dogs. That brings me to puppies. Can you train puppies with these? Yes, you can. I usually start that no earlier than 12 weeks. Typically closer to 16 weeks old, I'll start introducing my prong collar. Um, perfectly safe to use with puppies. And again, now we're not sticking these on puppies and correcting the hell out of them because, guys, these collars are not just for correcting dogs. So remember I said earlier, this is like the power steering, power brakes. Um, with these little prongs acting like fingers, it just transfers so much more information with so much less from your leash. So you call like, it the magic collar. Yeah, you, you give, you know, a small flick on your leash can mean so much more in a prong collar versus just a plain flat buckle collar. So um, I use this as my go-to for even dogs who don't have any sort of like problem behaviors. 
I train all dogs in prong collars because I have yet to find a dog that doesn't benefit from it and doesn't respond better with it. Well, and I feel like it, it takes, <laughs> so it's the bridge. So you have a puppy, you start it with a slip lead or whatever. You start working with a slip lead, great. Once you learn or they learn or you learn together to transfer this information with, and I'm looking, I'm not just looking in her lap, y'all. It's, <laughs> it's the collar. But once you learn, thank you. Once you, once you're transferring information successfully, once you've taught a heel, a really solid one successfully with one of these guys, mm -hmm. now you're moving to your e-collar because you want to do off leash work. Yeah. It's so much easier because they know, they know yeah. what this feels like. They know exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And once you've taught simple things, it, I, I just think it makes it all easier. Yeah. Oh yeah. I use, so I don't even use my prong collar just to teach, um, heel and leash manners. I use my prong collar to teach all basic obedience. Um, anywhere that I want to use leash pressure and guidance, I'm using a prong um, because they just, they're easy and they work and it's not from a place of harming dogs. And I'm sorry, I keep going back to that. I hope that never comes across as defensive, um, but it's just, I feel like I'm constantly combating all of this mainstream information out there that's just crap. And I've had so many people come to me saying, I was told that this was barbaric, or I was told that this was bad for my dog, or I was told that I should only use this for this and that, or I was told that I shouldn't use this for fearful dogs, or I shouldn't use this for aggressive dogs. I mean, that's all incorrect. Um, I have trained aggressive dogs on prong collars. I've trained extremely fearful dogs on prong collars successfully. Um, so ignore all that stuff that you come across and do your own research, like make your own decision. If you're on the fence and you're not sure and you're coming across all this information, like I really encourage you to take a similar approach to what I did and go, you know what? I am a rational, thinking, logical human being that cares about my dog and I don't want to hurt them. Why don't I just use some common sense and try this? Like, and I'm not the only, I'm far from being the only trainer out there who's no. talking about the benefits. There's tons of trainers out there. Um, talking about benefits of prong collars, but there's way more people out there being loud mouth about like prong collars are bad. And if you look into, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but, but if you look into the trainers that have proof of their work, you will find tons of information out there of people successfully training dogs on prong collars. Be the judge yourself. Look at their body language. I have, you know, hundreds of videos on my channel. You can see all the dogs in their body language. Does this like, look like an intimidated, upset? Oh, well, the, now she does because she's tail. like, well, now she's going to put her ears down because she's like, I want to get up. Are you going to let me? Are you going to let me? So, right. Belle loves her prong collar. And look, this is a like happy dog. And oh my God, she's wearing an e-collar right now. And right. She's in a good mood and she's happy. Like, right. <laughs> okay. um, now you're throwing now me. Now you're throwing prong collars on the floor. What is it? So, I know. I know like, we're, we're indulging here. I know, <laughs> right? Don't do what we are doing. Yeah, please, please curl. Oh, well. Right, and she didn't go to place because somebody hit her with a whip or shocked the crap out of her. And, you know, that's oh, just not. Don't get me wrong. I've shocked the crap not out of her in place. place. Like, <laughs> I think that's the, I mean, I think, so I think that's the thing. And it's one of the things we talk about this over and over and over again. We yeah. talk about e-collars and talk about con collars is, when people are telling you, you know, the only way we should ease everyone into, you know, if it takes you six months or a year or two years to fix their anxiety with what, why do you want the dog to be anxious for that long? Why do you want them to be lunging away from you every time that you try to walk them yeah. for that long and not being able to teach them so that you guys can communicate together and just get on with life? Yeah. I mean, that brings up a lot of, um, again, the trainers out there who are against prong collars will say like, oh, so you take shortcuts to train? Fuck yeah, I do. Well, right. Like, of course. A shortcut is not a bad thing. Why? Why did shortcut get a negative connotation? I, yeah, I don't know. like there are shortcuts that are, are not beneficial, but there's also lots of shortcuts that are great. Like I take shortcuts to work, and guess what? I'm not late, and it sometimes hurt anything. I use brownie mix instead of making them with virgin Madagascar <laughs> vanilla or cacao from right. wherever I don't even know. But well, yes. Well, but then are your brownies really brownies? Hell yeah, they yeah, are. They are. <laughs> and they are brownies when I eat the batter raw, too. Exactly. <laughs> so, like, don't, like,
let people bully you, whether it's personal or you're just reading articles and stuff and people shame you into going, oh, you know, you shouldn't take shortcuts. Your dog isn't really trained if you're using a prong collar. It's like, you know what? If I can get success using a prong collar and avoid the shoulder surgery, right. which there are people out there who I have. I have... know someone who, a, a, a six foot two or three man who's been an athlete in his whole life, who's mm -hmm. had frozen shoulder for a year mm -hmm. because of his dog. Seriously. Oh yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. But like, there's a proof right there. Because of a puller. Um, I mean, people. And he's a good dog. He's just a puller. Yeah. People, uh, I mean, people being pulled down on their faces by their dogs, either just pulling or lunging at something. like. Why is it wrong for you to be able to turn that dog's walk around in one walk? Because I tell you, every yep. single dog yep. that comes to me for a boarding train, one walk on the prong collar, and they're walking in a heel. Like, they're walking in a heel on a soft leash. Doesn't mean it's perfect. Like, there's still lots of work to do. Um, but, but you know, if somebody looked at you and you said, okay, I'm having a hard time losing weight. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to be more fit than I am. And I'm having a hard time with that. And you know what? The only way I stay on track is to stay with my personal trainer. I love them and it works for me and mm -hmm. they keep me on track. Does that mean I'm not actually losing weight? Does that mean I'm not actually fit or healthy or okay? Right. Because I need someone to help me stay on track. I mean, I don't think you do what works. Yeah, exactly. And, and the thing is, like, what is wrong with a shortcut when it immediately, not not immediately, like, there's some training involved. Quickly. Yes, it, there's training involved. It's not just slap this collar on at work. So understand that. It is, it, a dog absolutely can and will pull on a prong collar. You have to apply the training, too. But, um, you know, to, to sit here and say, we can turn this dog's walk around in one to two walks using a prong collar. And that's me speaking from the place of being a dog trainer. So obviously... If you're learning this for the first time, don't be surprised. It takes you a little longer. There's nothing wrong with that either. But you can do it. You don't have to be a professional dog trainer oh, yeah. to be able to train your dog. Absolutely. The difference being you struggling for a couple of walks or, you know, a couple of weeks versus months and years. Right. Like, right. Or the dog you can't take to the park because yep. it, you can't yep. control. And I'm sorry. Um, if my shortcut keeps my dog from having a damaged trachea, from, because it's not pulling with a prong right. collar versus if I'm trying to spend months and months and months and months working on this, like, hey, like, let's just stop and get a treat every two steps before you have a chance to pull. Like, I can't even fathom, I'll tell you. I mean, I just can't even fathom trying to walk a dog on a flat, flat buckle. I mean, it's it's just if yeah, I'm using the training's a leash not there. and yeah. the training's not there. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, yeah, we, I see we've had some, some Timothy questions. says, and I think he was with us last oh, week. Oh, yeah. So, hi, Timothy. Yay. Um, do the Herms for Air prong collars that use a snap buckle work as well? I bought the one with the quick release chain, but you still have to thread the loop on loop chain on the collar. Also, this may be more of a comment. About 20 years ago, we had an e collar, uh, maybe a shocker that used a plastic buckle. It was so much easier to put on the dog than the MT300 e collar uses now. I wish they offered offered both styles styles of buckles. They do. They do. You can. Um, so I'll come back to your first comment there. But as far as the, the ET300s, if you're talking about the e-collar technology, um, the, the right. collar that comes in the box is a biofin collar that has a, a full buckle and everything. But they, you can go on their website and order snap style um, collars. And I have used them. Um, what I found personally is... You saw it live, guys. My light just fell on my head. Nope. Uh, place? I don't blame my dog for breaking Belt. place. Place? <laughs> you know, you never know what's going to go down on the live. Like, you're in the safety of your freaking bedroom and the light dome. Y'all, seriously. Oh, okay. that's too hot to touch. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so, let's see. We've had a... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> We're fine. We're all fine. We had the, the light hit us on the way down and then burn you when you tried to grab it and sharp shards on the floor. We're just going to keep rolling, but let me put my dog back on, please. Yes. Please. Girl. Wow. We're just going to keep going. exciting, y'all. All right. <laughs> oh. Clean up some glass in a few. Woo. All right. So we're talking about. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Timothy <laughs> says, wow, bang. <laughs> Yes, we agree. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so now I'm sitting here wondering what the F poltergeist is like. No, in it's this too house. hot. I think the, I think the incandescents were too hot, and it burned the glass. We've only been anyway. in this house for a couple of months, and so I'm wondering what else uh, is hiding for us. I think it's time to buy some light bulbs. Um, All right, so, so you can. We're talking power. power. You don't use it. In my personal, like when I have used they, so there's two styles, and I don't have them on me to show you, but. Um, with the snap, like what you're talking about, the quick buckle style, um, it's a nice metal buckle, but I have found that my collar tends to not stay tight enough when I use that, and that if it is tight enough, it's really hard to get that buckle on, and I've seen a lot of owners who are using that who their collar tends to be a little too loose, um, because when it's tight enough, it's hard to get that buckle to reach. So what I found that I really like that e-collar makes is they have that snap style buckle and a bungee. So it's got like a little bungee ring that's on the collar. And the reason I like that is because it's just, it gives that little extra kind of give to get that snap on, but it stays tighter if that makes sense. So it holds, it almost is like a ponytail holder. Right, if you think so about it. um, it's just a little ponytail holder insert on the collar that gives a little bit of flexion, a little bit of elasticity to it. So go to the e-collar um, technologies website. My neck actually kind of hurts because it hit my half right oh. now. <laughs> well, I got hit the shin. Yeah. So I feel like, am I bleeding? I'm not bleeding. Okay. Um, so, so go to e-collar technologies website, go to the accessories and look up the collar styles. And they do make those buckles that are easier than the actual full online buckle. You can get the snap style. Um, Anyway, now going back to, let's see, you said does Herm Springer. Snap buckle. So, yeah, the, the Herm Springer. Now, oh, hold on, because you mentioned he said he has to still thread the loop. Change. Yeah, yeah, no, your only options on the Herm Springer are that quick release or your um, your regular just prongs that snap onto each other. They don't have like a buckle or anything. And honestly, logistically, I don't know that there would be a way to do it. But maybe if you invent it, you could sell it to where you make lots of money. I think so, because you brought it out here. You should show everybody yeah. the putting on and the and backup and how you do yeah. that. Yeah, so I'm going to use Belle as my demo dog to show how to properly fit and put on a crown collar. And then we're going to put on a backup collar. So I'm going to explain really quickly what I'm talking about there. So and we're going to do that back here, not in glass. Yeah, I'm going to away from the stars. Jesus. Um, okay. Sorry, this still making me laugh. No, who the hell expects that? Dog, it's legit. I don't know if you can hear it. Is it so hot? Um, yeah, but like our the light is in pieces. There's it, like there's like four pieces like that. No, yeah. like three. I don't know. I can't count. Oh look, there's a little button. Right, that's why I held it together before now. Yes, we need a new light. Yay! All right. Okay, so. Now, all the people who aren't looking for an excuse to redecorate and buy light fixtures. Okay. Crown collar. So, when oh, you... Oh, you need back? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> so that it fits. I'm going to be like, oh, this is too small. Okay. So, one thing you do have to be aware of is with your crown collar, it is possible for this collar to come apart while you're using it. Not that it happens all the time, but like it, it's happened a, a handful of times with me. Sometimes, um, I mean, obviously it can happen from if you're just going too quickly, not paying enough attention. Maybe your dog has long hair and you didn't see it. I've done it. Yeah. Yep. Where you only get one link in and you didn't realize that. And then you got on your only got it part the way. Yeah. In. Or you got to watch. Let's see if I can do this. You got to watch that you don't. Now, also make sure I've seen people try to like put these prongs in here and pull them through. Don't do that. You're just going to bend your wings. But you know, you get one in here and one up here, and it just doesn't line up right. So, um, I've also had it happen when I've had dogs out on walks, and then I release them for a bit and let them just kind of have some some playtime or whatever, and they roll in the grass and they roll around oh, yeah. and it'll undo the links and then they get up and we start on our walk and suddenly the collar's falling off. <laughs> um, it's not that it's super common, but it can happen. It's common enough. So if you are at all, at all remotely concerned about what would happen if your dog was off leash, you need to use a backup collar. And what that looks like is you'll have your prong collar on and then I showed you earlier, but I'll show you again in case you're jumping in now. You have this swivel link is where your leash goes this other ring is going to be where we buckle a carabiner. 
And we're going to take, I mean, you can just get a regular carabiner. You want something strong enough. But you're just going to buckle this to your regular flat buckle collar that you're going to leave. And it's going to be on the dog's neck as well. And I was like, oh, are we going somewhere? Yes. <laughs> See, look, the fear in her eyes because I'm picking up her prom tire. She's like, oh, we're going to work. It made her yawn. Um, so, um, prom collar, backup collar, and that's just so that, and I'll, I'll show you this, that's so that if your prom collar were to pop off, you're not completely disconnected from your dog. So, let's go ahead, and if you want to man the camera, mm -hmm. if we need to move it around. Yes. Hopefully you can see this well enough. But to put this on, again, undo my links. This should never be able to slide over the dog's head because if it can slide over her head, that collar is too big. So we're going to bring this up underneath and buckle it so that it is sitting just under her ears. It should be a very high and snug. Now, if you're using a remote collar, and I do get asked a lot, should I use the phone? Oh, and what order? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I get asked a lot, should I use the prong or the remote? And the answer is yes, you use both. Because if you're remote collar training, your um, remote collar does not give your dog any directional information. So your prong collar is going to be what's telling the dog you know, your directional information. So you use both. And if you are using a remote collar, that will sit under your prong. So prong is always up highest. Okay? And then what we'll do. Actually, I'm going to leave you here. Let me bring her a little closer. Yeah, just like, yeah. That's it. Um, okay, so you can see a little better there. Prong is up high, and the remote's just below that. Your flat buckle collar, if you need this as a backup collar. Now, if you're just using your prong in your house for training, don't worry about backup collar, because if your dog gets loose, if it's not a big deal, you just catch the dog and put it back on. This is more for if you're going to be out and about on a walk and you'd be concerned about what would happen if your dog is loose. But you just put your, reg your regular flat buckle down here. Um, and then you can. I could. Let me just There you go. That's perfect. All right. So leash is going to attach here. And then. <laughs> she's like, rub belly. So make sure that your leash comes out the top that way. Your carabiner is going to go right here and just clip to the D-ring on your flat buckle. Okay? And the reason we do and that... see if I can like let everybody see that. I'm moving a laptop, guys, so bear with me. Thing. Okay, so if we get a good view there, leash connects to your swivel. So that's what that looks like when they're all dressed. Okay, and the reason we do this is let's say we're walking along and that collar does pop off, okay, you're still attached to your dog, all right? Obviously, you're not going to continue your walk like this, but at least your dog is not running loose, you're still attached, and then you can grab this and put it back on, okay? But we're going to take it off because we're not going out on a walk. We're not! Good girl. Good old place. Okay. All right, any other questions? Actually, it looks like we've had one more come in. Uh, so Brad says, it is my understanding that the remote should only be used after a dog knows the basics. Is this true? Yes and no. Um, so like I was just talking about the remote collar not giving directional information. Um, so when you're teaching your basic obedience, you want to start the dog on your command. So we'll use the down as an example. If I'm teaching down, if I try and start just with the remote collar, and especially if I'm not using a leash or anything else, me hitting that button on the remote is only going to be a confusing sensation that the dog doesn't know what to do with. Like, we're talking about a dog that doesn't know the down command. So I have to start teaching the down command first. And the way I personally do it is I put a prom collar on the dog, and I use pressure and release and some luring with food, and I guide that dog into a down and I do several repetitions, or lots of repetitions with this, until the dog starts to understand the down command. Now, they don't have to master the down command before you start your remote collar training. And a lot of times I find that if the dog is starting to get it, but maybe not quite fully understanding it, or they'll get it with lots of leash guidance, but not so much without, um, 
I'll go ahead and start using my remote as well. And we're not going to get super into detail. We're actually about up on time. We're not going to get super into detail about using the remote collar this time. That can be a future yeah. live. Yeah. Um, but I've got videos on my YouTube channel about like how to teach remote collar down, remote collar place. And so you would use your prong collar and leash to help guide the dog. And especially because when you start using your remote, um, that can serve as a distraction, even at the lowest level. Because when you're talking obedience and remote collar training, you're doing your remote collar at the lowest level that the dog feels. Right. So um, even that low level can be a distraction where you tell the dog down and maybe they normally sort of get it unleashed and then you do it with your remote and they're kind of like, ooh, that. Yeah. Then you'd use your prong collar to guide. Um, let me make sure that answered your question. Should I? Yeah, so you want to start your basics with leash guidance, but you don't have to master them before you move to the remote. You just want them to have a basic understanding of their basics. The basics of the basics. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. If you want your dog to have the basics of the basics and, and well, then your remote will clarify the basics. What would maybe be a, a good way to sort of say that is that they, they need to have an idea. You've worked with them some. You've done yes. some obedience work before. So they know, okay, we're going to do something and maybe I'm going to get some kibble for it. We're going to, we're working we're familiar with your commands. Right, yeah. so that they they've not not like the first time you know brand new dog you just got them from the shelter wherever and you bring them into the house and they're like cool have an e collar and let's go because they're you know that depends though well and I'm only pointing that out because um yeah so I don't like I have dogs brought in for boarding trains for example so when a dog comes to me for a boarding train typically I'm not starting my remote collar work until day two or three. Um, but that's because I use that first day or two to start my foundational work on all of my obedience commands. However, I still have plenty of dogs that within the first hour or even half hour of being here, they have an e collar on to work through other behaviors, correcting right. unwanted behaviors. So don't feel like you can't use a remote collar very soon. It right. really just depends on how much you've been able to work with the dog. So as long as you're getting a, a start on your foundation. Well, and what your knowledge is in general of working. Yep, Probably. exactly. All right, what else? That makes sense. I'm a first-time dog owner. I've only had her for about a month. I'm learning and slowly working on training. Great, that's awesome. So um, first-time dog owner and, and you're learning with your tools and your structure, like that's fantastic and, and good for you. Like I hope that I hope that goes as smoothly as possible. So yeah, just um, remember that your leash is your friend. Um, use your leash in the house, use that, you know, use that leash to guide that dog to do what you're trying to teach it, go where you need it to go, um, and, and that's going to be what starts things before you start your remote collar work. But also don't be afraid to use your remote collar, like, that you have to reach some certain level that's... Yeah, know, there is no magic, there, and I think there's a lot of us in, that, that, you know, had some hesitation in the yeah. beginning. I'm gonna screw it up. I'm gonna. Oh yeah, that makes you a normal human being. Like, right. I've been there too. That's you know, right. We're afraid to like use these tools because we're afraid of hurting our dogs. None of us want to do that. No. Um, but usually we tend to err on the side of caution and safety, and very few people tend to be overcorrecting their dogs. Right. Or you know, that's I almost never see that. So, um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here. We we can clean up some glass. And, Clean up some glass and maybe <laughs> fix our nets and our shins. <laughs> like you get some ice packs and uh, yeah. If you're jumping on, wine, I don't know. if you're jumping on here right at the end, go back and watch the replay when it loads. I don't know what time it was when that happened, but it. it I know, we're gonna have to go ahead and watch that ourselves. I know. I was like, what it's happened? towards like the last third of the video that my light fixture just fell on top of from us. the sky, from, from the ceiling, like right. just bam, yay! And no, uh, and so we're gonna. Let's see. So yeah, we've got like three large pieces yes. of light fixture that and some happen. smaller chunks. And um my dog Wow, that is wow, that is sharp. <laughs> oh, good job. And now she's bleeding. I have barely, barely touched that thing. Look at that. Yes. Holy you cow, actually have a piece of ice stuck in your finger. Yeah. So on that note, hope you're not squeamish. Bye! We love you. <laughs> We'll see you at same bat time, same bat channel next week. Subscribe, you'll get the notifications, like us on Facebook, all the things. Good night. We'll see you next week.